Well, again, good afternoon, everyone. God is the author and the finisher of all life. God created mankind in his own image. And it's God's will and desire that we become like him in his likeness. When it says in his likeness, that's to become because the natural man without God's spirit is not in his likeness. And as we get his spirit and as we uh, are fully born of him, when Christ returns, we will be fully in his likeness. We read in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, you don't need to go there for your notes, for your reference, how God has given gifts to those in the church. For the spiritual growth and the edification of the body, a body that he has put together, as his word says, as it pleases him. Well, I share with you, brethren, that God also gave mankind gifts. He made each one of us different. We have different strengths and different weaknesses. We have different characters. We look different. Are all carpenters. You know, when we look at what people do for their livelihood, you, you know, you spend more than those that work anyway. <laughs> uh, you work more than a third of your life. Did God make all carpenters with a desire, I want to be a carpenter? Are all engineers, are all skilled with their hands? You don't want me working on your car, I'll tell you that right now. Not these big hands. I'm not a mechanic. We can do a few simple things, but we'll keep it at that. To some, God has given the most beautiful of voices and talent for music and musical instruments. Some are composers, some are writers, and some have written some of the most beautiful hymns that we sing that don't have an idea of the full truth of Almighty God. Some are teachers, and they have special gifts and talents, and how about one of patience? I cannot imagine being a teacher and teaching a classroom of young children, teenage children, and we have some that in our group that are teachers and have had to go on through that, and I've heard some stories. God made each one, and he gave each one differing talents. He gave them different abilities. And many, brethren, many have used those abilities to serve others. Many that don't even understand the truth of Almighty God have put their lives on the line and given their life for others. Certainly in this world, there are those that are takers. There are those who look upon the self and good old number one. But there are also many that have placed others above themselves, above their families, and have given their very lives to serve. First and foremost is the example of our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I have to mention God first. God has been the perfect example and the author and knows what sacrifice is as he gave his only begotten son for the sins of mankind. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And he died that we may have life and that we may have it more abundantly. I want you to think for a moment about those who serve us. The police that serve our neighborhoods and keep us safe, you know? They're, they're doing a job of trying to keep safe. Our firemen. My dad was a fireman, 17 years. He told me some stories when he was a fireman. They were also paramedics. 
and some awful stories that he shared with me that had bothered him until that day, and I won't, I won't share them with you here. But when you have to go on upon a car crash, I'll just leave it at that. How about our nurses, our doctors, those who govern? There are some who have and are serving others as a living sacrifice. And when I say that, I want you to think about those who have given their lives to protect the freedoms that we enjoy today. There's no question this nation was divinely instituted by Almighty God. How about their families? How about the families that suffered hardship, pain and suffering? And I hear stories and see our military and they're in Afghanistan and they're in Iraq and they're wherever dispersed across this earth. They're away from their families for 11 months a year. They get 30 days leave, 11 months a year. They're away from their children, their wives, their husbands, their moms, their dads, their brothers, their sisters. They're living as a living sacrifice and they put their lives on the line each and every day. Just as our police put their lives on the line and one lost his life yesterday in Louisiana. Brutally murdered, just snuffed out like he meant nothing. Did he have a mom and a dad? Did he have a wife at home and children? How about those others that I just mentioned like our military or firemen or other jobs, whatever they are, where they're putting their lives on the line. They've had children that have had to be raised without one or maybe both parents in some cases because of that sacrifice. They sacrificed for others. They put others above themselves. I want to read for you a letter. This was written I don't know if any of you have heard of him. This was actually brought out in the inauguration yesterday. Major Sullivan Ballou. A letter that he wrote his wife at the beginning of the Civil War. July 14th, 1861. My very dear wife, Indications are very strong that we will move in a few days, perhaps tomorrow. Lest I should not be able to write you again, I feel impelled to write a few lines that may fall under your eye when I shall be no more. Try not to do that. Our movement may be one of a few days' duration and full of pleasure, and it may be one of severe conflict conflict and death to me. Not my will, but thine, O God, be done. If it is necessary that I should fall on the battlefield for any country, I am ready. I have no misgivings about or lack of confidence in the cause in which I am engaged, and my courage does not halt or falter. I know how strongly American civilization now leans upon the triumph of government and how a great debt we owe to those who went before us through the blood and suffering of the revolution. And I am willing, perfectly willing, to lay down all my joys in this life to help maintain this government and to pay that debt. But my dear wife, when I know that with my own joys I lay down nearly all of yours and replace them in this life with care and sorrows, when after having eaten for long years the bitter fruit of orphanage myself, I must offer it as their only sustenance to my dear little children. Is it weak or dishonorable while the banner of my purpose floats calmly and proudly in the breeze that my unbounded love for you, my darling wife and children, should struggle in fierce, though useless 
contest with my love of country. For Major Ballou, it was about the freedoms that we share. It was about the religious freedoms that we share. It was about a greater cause. As I mentioned, a nation divinely instituted by God. He loved his wife. He loved his children. He loved his family. He had hoped to see them again and be with them, but he felt compelled to write this letter just in case. One week later, Major Ballou was killed in the field of battle. He, like so many others, was a true example of a living sacrifice. We've heard the saying, all gave some and some gave all. If you turn with me, brethren, to Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> We'll begin in verse 1. <clears throat> Paul writes, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now I want to go through that verse again, only a little slower this time, and I'm going to add to you what the Greek meaning of most of these words is, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living, and that word living is live, lively. Lively to me is action. Sacrifice. And that is literally or figuratively. That's the Greek 2378. And holy, and I've spoke on this before because uh, you look at the word holy, and uh, actually I was looking at it from another perspective, and that was saint. What is a saint, and what does the scripture say a saint is? And it says, a saint is a most holy thing. And this word here, holy, used in this verse is Greek number 40, and it means saint. Most holy thing. To me, when I hear that, I think of responsibility, a responsibility that we have to our God and to others. Because you are looked at by God, those that have God's Holy Spirit, those that have repented and been baptized and received His Spirit, you are looked at as a most holy thing. And that word acceptable is the Greek number 2101. Acceptable, well-pleasing. Are we well-pleasing in our relationship with God? Are we well-pleasing in how we conduct ourselves? seven days a week, not just at services, but throughout our lives. Are we well-pleasing to God? And he says, this is your reasonable, and that word reasonable means fair, sensible. Fair and sensible, our reasonable service. Here's what God tells us, this reasonable service that his people are to have. It's not me speaking. It's God's word. Let's continue on in verse 2. He says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. God says his word is truth. Continuing on in verse 3, says, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. We're not to think more highly of ourselves. We're to be humble, a humble people, and serve God humbly. But to think soberly, he continues, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. God has given each one of us a measure of faith, some more than others. Some bear fruit, some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundredfold. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. We're all different parts of the body. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. 
We're also members of one another because we're the family of God. And we share in that Holy Spirit of God. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given us, let us use them. And here he's talking about the gifts that God has given his people. He gives us gifts. Just as he has given physical mankind gifts, he's given the spiritual body gifts. According to the grace that is given us, let us use them. Be using them. Do. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, and that word ministry means serving. Let us use it to our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, and he who exhorts in exhortation, and he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. This is, this is what God is defining as our reasonable service as these living sacrifices that we are to be. This is all part of that day-to-day living in Christ Jesus. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor and giving preference to one another. See, in serving, you put yourself behind others. You don't lead to the front of the pack. It's not me, 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 I'm number one, it's others. Just as that beautiful hymn we sang, let others see Jesus in you. Preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. You know, we're to be strong in the faith. We have to be strong. We have to build up. We build up through God's word and through prayer. And God gives more. When you're using what he gives you, he will give you more of his spirit. He'll give you more of that spiritual strength and help us to overcome. But he wants us, he wants us to be fervent. He wants us to be filled with that first love. Serving the Lord and rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. And you know, that's hard, brother. Sometimes they, that, That's not an easy thing. Patient in tribulation. Boy, I'll tell you, when you're hurting, you, you, you want relief. Or when you're going through something, you want God to intervene. Sometimes God's going to wait a little bit and, and let us learn from that. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. And we remain steadfast and we trust God. And we have to believe him that he will deliver us in due time. Distributing to the needs of the saints and given to hospitality. Bless those, here, here's some hard sayings here. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. You know, the other day I tried something, and you know, I've talked about this before, you get around people that are in a, a bad mood, it, it can bring you down. It's just, there's something about that force, that negative force, and it will catch on if you allow it. Well, this gal, I was going through drive through she was kind of rude and this and that, and I stopped, I caught myself, because you know, the natural thing is to, you know, I wasn't going to snap at her. Don't don't take me out of context. But but uh, I wasn't going to be real cheerful either. But I stopped, caught myself. I smiled. I told her I hope she had a wonderful day. And I meant it sincerely. And her frown turned upside down. She began to smile and she said, thank you. And that helped lift her day. Just that little thing. We can do those things. And it's those little things, you know, that... Uh, Help each one of us. We need that. We need to be uplifted. We need to, and when we come to services, we need to be edified. I hope we go home each time after services and we say, boy, what a good Sabbath. What a wonderful Sabbath. God gave me more. I learned more. I was with God's people. It was uplifting. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And our hearts do go out just as we hear those stories of those that are just going through very difficult times. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your minds on high things, but associate with the humble. And do not be wise in your own opinion. 
You know, we get those lessons coming up a lot, don't we, with unleavened bread, how that bread of humility and how we're to be humble. Do not be, oh, I read that. Repay no one evil for evil. God's people don't repay people evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. And God wants us to, you know, to work things out with people. And sometimes we do have differences. And sometimes, you know, we have to, you know, if you, if you have a, a problem with your brother, God's word says, go to your brother and talk to him. Work it out. We're to work things out. Sometimes your brother won't come to you. You know, and maybe you have to go to them, but get that stuff behind. Get it behind us. Move forward. Live uh, peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give uh, place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. The wrath is for God. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Now, wasn't Christ the perfect example in all this? Those that persecuted him, those that beat him, he didn't turn. He turned the other cheek. They plucked the hairs out of his beard. His sacrifice began that night. Therefore, if any is hungry... Your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. And do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's how we overcome evil, with good. Jesus Christ was the perfect example of overcoming temptation, of overcoming evil. This is how we're instructed to be a living sacrifice. We are not good old number one. God is our number one. God is number one. And we are to glorify our Father in heaven and Jesus Christ. And we are to show the love of God through us to others. How about the two greatest commandments that Jesus gave us? Recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew 22, just for your notes, verses 36 through 40. One came to Jesus and uh, he said, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? What is the top commandment there? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. In other words, all of your being. We are to love God with all of our being. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, we love ourselves. We like to take care of ourselves. In the same way, we're to love others, brethren. That's what he wants us to do. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. And you can look at any of God's laws, and you can sum them up right here, because they fall in those two categories. It's all about those relationships. It's all about those we come in contact with, whether it be at our work, whether it be at a restaurant, whether it be at the gas station, wherever it may be. A living sacrifice. You know, God told us, Jesus, his words in Matthew 10, I want to go through a few verses there. I think it's so very important that we remind ourselves In fact, not only do I think it's important, God thinks it's important. He thinks it's important that we remind ourselves. That's why we're reminded from year to year. We go through the holy days. You didn't learn them once at God's calling, and then that's over. You learned those lessons. Boy, you know what Passover means, so you don't need to keep that anymore. No, we go year to year, don't we? And we rehearse, and we remember, and we're called to remembrance. And as we go from Sabbath to Sabbath, we're reminded in God's word the lessons that he teaches us that we're to hold to. Matthew 10, beginning in verse 32, the words of our Savior. He said, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, and you confess him by our actions in front of others, we can uh, confess him verbally, but also through our example. 
Him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. He says, don't think that I came to bring peace on the earth. And, and isn't that what the majority of people think? They think that Jesus came to bring peace. He said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. What is he saying here? Is he trying to destroy the family? Not at all. What he's teaching us here is that we have to put God first, above all. And it's not to hate or to be at variance with our family. We're to respect our parents, right? God's not the author of confusion. We're to honor our parents. What he's saying here is love less. Love God more. God has to be number one. Our relationship with him has to take priority. And when you were called and when you began to see God's truth, for those that didn't have families that were that were of the same beliefs, there's a challenge. And people are trying to pull you back. I can remember talking to my dad. I love him dearly. And I was sharing with him that we did not keep Christmas anymore. And we had, I don't know how long of a talk, it was pretty good chat. I went through a lot of, a lot of uh, truth with him and, and uh, the origins of Christmas and things of that nature. And he said, all right, I end, okay. Just don't tell me you're not keeping Easter. So, you know, and I said, Dad, well, a matter of fact, well, that conversation went on quite a ways after that. But, you know, the following week we talked, and he said, you know what, what you told me about Easter and all that? I said, yeah. He goes, I talked to our minister, and he goes, that you're, it's true. He goes, so I guess you can do whatever you want on that day. Yeah. I, I was like, Dad, you missed the whole, you know. But that, unless God opens, I don't put my dad down. I don't want to come across like I do in any way. I love and respect him. But he didn't understand. God didn't open his mind to that at that time. But the point is that Jesus is making here, we have to be willing, our parents that we love, our brothers, our sisters, coming out of this world, he says, put me first. This is the way to walk. And the world is contrary to my ways. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here and speaking you know, from God's word. The world is contrary to God's ways. In fact, Romans 8 tells us, right, that man apart from God's spirit is an enemy. He doesn't understand, but Jesus is telling us, and let's go on in verse 37. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. These are not my words, brethren. These are the words of our Savior, the Son of Almighty God, Jesus the Christ. And he says, if we do not love God more than all others, we are not worthy of him. And he who does not take up his stake and follow me is not worthy of me. And I'm not talking a piece of meat. He's talking about the, the you know, taking up God's truth, his way of life, and following that perfect example of Jesus Christ. Take it up. Take that persecution. Take what the world's going to throw your way. If we don't, he says, we're not worthy of him. He who finds his life will lose it. And that's talking about finding your life in this world. I've got it made. I've got, I have I have this. I don't need God. That person, he says, will lose his life for his sake. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake. He who lives is that living sacrifice. And that's what taking up that stake is, living that living sacrifice, doing God's will, being that example. Day after day, we pick it up, and we move forward, and we draw closer to God. What life, I have to ask, is more important? Is it the calling that has, God has given us, or is it this fleshly, fleeting, brief life? It passes us by so quickly. Mine is 
depending on whatever God gives me left, about two-thirds gone. It goes quickly. But he has for his people, those that pick up, that are that living sacrifice, a beautiful and wondrous kingdom lies ahead. We are to glorify God in our actions. We are to glorify him in our relationship with him and the way we treat others. And that comes with our daily life. Sometimes we fall short. Sometimes we aren't the example that we should be. We all fall short. But we have to pick up and try to do what is right. And we have to go before God and ask him to help us. To help strengthen our weaknesses. Because you know what? We have weaknesses. And God can strengthen those weaknesses. I've had things in my life that God has helped me. It's only by his grace. They are gone. They are behind me. And we move on to the next thing. It's that overcoming. It's that growing in that grace and knowledge. It's growing in that relationship and maturing as a Christian. Just as a child doesn't know everything right out of the gate, they have to grow and they have to learn and they have to be taught until they become a strong man or woman able to stand on their own. Of course, we stand with God, so don't take that out of context. Another reminder, brethren, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we are reminded that we're not our own. Verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 6 says, You were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. He says they're no longer yours. Of course, he was our creator to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. But when he called us, when that shed blood was placed upon us, you were bought. You are no longer your own. And we are to glorify our Father in heaven in Jesus Christ by our actions and how we conduct ourselves. And Paul reminds us to leave that old man behind. 1 Corinthians uh, uh same chapter, right where you're at. I'm just going to read a couple of verses going to verse 9. He says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? I've seen some sometimes, and please don't take this the wrong way. I'm not talking about anybody in particular. But I have seen in my years in the church sometimes, I don't, I don't think sometimes people are connecting the dots. He says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? We cannot go back to the old man. We can't go back to that life of sin and think that God's just going to wink at us and say, it's okay. It's all right. Jesus took care of it for you. We're not to make him his sacrifice all over again, are we? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, set apart, is what he's talking about, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit, of our God. We're to walk in that newness. It's all part of that living sacrifice when God opened our mind and called us out of that. Which goes right back to the first commandment. Having no other gods before him. you would turn with me to 1 Peter, I want to read all of 1 Peter chapter 2, because again, this too also shows us what that living sacrifice is. Because you have been called, brethren, as we read in Romans 12, you have been called to live your life as a living sacrifice. We talked about the examples of others who haven't had God's calling but they lived their lives as a living sacrifice for others. And we use different examples of that. And 
And you can take those analogies and draw them into the spiritual. And we look, we are spiritual Israel. We are to be spiritually living sacrifices. And that shows in our physical actions as well as the spiritual. Because it begins with the thought. It ends with the deed. Therefore, in Peter 2, beginning in verse 1, laying aside all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy and envy and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up in a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture. He says, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. That's referring to Jesus Christ. He is that chief cornerstone. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And there are some that don't believe. They don't believe. Christ is the Son of God. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God has called us into light and truth. And we're not to be entangled in the darkness after that. We're to come out and stay out. Who once were not a people, but now are the people of God. Who have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, for us, having our conduct among those who we come in contact with. That when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. See, your example is planting seeds, and there will be a day that they will see. And they're going to remember that example that they see, and it may help them to turn. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. And we should pray for our leadership. Pray that God give them wisdom. We have to do the right thing. For this is the will of God that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. For by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all. Love the brotherhood. Fear God and honor the king. We are to be respectful of those that are in authority over us. We're to be respectful to the police and teach them, or I'm sorry, treat them with the respect that they deserve, just as those that are in office, whether they be mayor or governor or a president, a senator, you're to treat them with respect. And you honor God by doing so. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear. And this here, you can look in our time. You work for an employer. You go to a job. Treat, that's your master there. That's, you know, just a way of saying it. It's, we say it differently today. That's our boss, right? Or, or uh, you know, who we report to. That's our manager. 
be submissive to your employer. I'll, I'll put it in modern terms. With all fear. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. That's a hard thing. These are mature things. These are things that take maturing as a Christian. That's what we do. And it becomes easier and it becomes a way of life. For this is commendable. If because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if when you were beaten for your faults, and I don't think there's anybody in this room or hearing this message that has been beaten for your faults. We've had some pretty good examples before us that were beaten. I think uh, Paul was beaten several times, wasn't he, for taking the truth of Almighty God out to the Gentiles, right? And he was beaten, he was imprisoned, and he suffered. And we as Christians have never suffered like many of those before us. I think I can speak for at least most that are hearing this. I lost my place. Uh, verse 20. And you take it patiently, but when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable for God. Sometimes you're going to do what is good, and it's going to be treated as something that you did as bad. And you're to just keep your chin up, try to have a positive attitude, take it patiently, because that is commendable before God. For to this cause you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile in return. I talked a little bit about that earlier, and here where it's written for us. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. He committed himself to his father and his father's work, and following that example of his father, is he's the express image of his Father, which is the image, the likeness that we are working toward, that we are to become. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the stake, on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Talking about that spiritual healing that God, by his stripes, and also there's times that we're anointed and we pray for God's healing through those stripes that Christ took in our place. For you were all sheep going astray, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your lives. Christ, our perfect example, whom we are to imitate, to whom we are become like-minded. And God's word talks about that like-mindedness and what we're to be doing in Philippians 2. A few more verses as we bring this to close. Philippians 2, beginning in chapter or verse 1, I'm sorry. He says, Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded having the same love and being of one accord, of one mind. We're to be like-minded. We're to have the mind of Christ. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. And that, that parallels what we read earlier. Let each of you look out, not for his own interest, not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Yes, for Christ, that's true, but we are not equal to God. We are his children. And <clears throat> I had a gentleman, it was about a year ago, I'm over, and my brother, obviously, has uh, talked about is the truth kind of sometimes rubs him the wrong way, but he's always asking questions. Anyway, a friend of his apparently is a minister in some church, and uh, he's also a roofer. He was doing some roofing for him, and I was over there to see my brother. Well, he came out to the car. I brought my brother back from lunch, and he comes out to the car, and he starts rattling off Philippians chapter 2 to me, word for word. He had it memorized. But the way he was looking at it was he was equal to God. He didn't want to hear one word from me. I went to ask him a question. He walked right away. 
walked right back to the house. He blasted me. He obviously, my brother had said, well, my brother, you know, keeps his habit. I mean, you know, who knows whatever, <clears throat> all he told him. But he blasted me with Philippians 2, and it was like, there you go, and walked away. I'm like, okay. <laughs> anyway. But he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men. Christ was that perfect example of humility. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death, death of the stake. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, and that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What a day that will be. But today, in our example, we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord in our life. Do you remember a few years ago the big thing that was going around? It was really a good thing. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? And if we look at things that we come into and situations in our life, what would my Savior do in this situation? Because that's whom we should be looking to, right? To God, to our Father, to Jesus Christ for that guidance. What would you do, Lord? Give me wisdom. Help me with this situation. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but how much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And we should fear. We should tremble before our God. And we should understand who God is and give him the reverence that he so justly deserves. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And I think most of you would agree, when you look out at the landscape, landscape today, we are living amongst a perverse generation which will continue to wax worse. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. If we're living as that living sacrifice, we are lights shining in this world. Holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Sometimes you might feel like you're running in vain. You're not. God has a plan for each one of us, and our labor is not in vain. We are glorifying our God. We are learning and overcoming and to become more like him, that we can be fully like him at the return of his son, Jesus Christ. Yes, I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith. Many of the apostles gave their lives. They shed their blood for the truth of Almighty God. It wasn't about them. It was about serving God. It was about serving his people. I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. We too are to be living our lives in the example of Christ as a living sacrifice under the glory of our Father in heaven and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to read for you a poem as we close this message. Before I do that, you know, when I spoke earlier, I forgot I brought this paper. We talk about those that have lived their lives as a living sacrifice. Those that have given their lives, just like those policemen in New York that were just got their dinner and they're sitting there in the car and they're probably talking about their family and whatever, their day, and, and, and somebody just comes up and takes their lives, takes them like they mean absolutely nothing, and their families at home that now have lost dad, a husband, a son, and they're gone until the resurrection of Almighty God. 
some numbers for you, brethren. The American Civil War, 750,000 deaths. Now, I want you to think about not only those 750,000 that lost their lives, but how about the 750,000 families that lost that key loved one in their lives? <coughs> World War II, 405,399 Americans. <coughs> World War I, 116,000. The Korean War, 54,000. Vietnam, 58,000. The American Revolutionary War, 25,000. The War of 1812, 18,000. I'm sorry, 15,000. Thousands upon thousands that gave their lives for a cause. A cause that was greater than them. It was out of a love for their families, for their countries, for the next generations. It wasn't just about them and their generation. It was about the future. It was about that future of freedom that we so sometimes take for granted that we have, that God has given us in this nation. And it's by God's protection. I don't want to take glory from God. I'm just using these people that have lived their lives as a living sacrifice, as an example for us, spiritual the spiritual body of Almighty God, that we are called to be a living sacrifice. And we have to remind ourselves, and we have to think about as we come in front of others, how are they perceiving us? Are they seeing Jesus in us? Just as we sung it, that, that hymn says it all. Let others see Jesus in you. I want to read for you this beautiful example in this poem of the message that we're trying to deliver today. This poem is titled, Carry On. A woman once fretted over the usefulness of her life. She feared she was wasting her potential being a devoted wife and mother. She wondered if the time and energy she invested in her husband and children would make a difference. At times she got discouraged because she so, uh, because so much of what she did seemed to be unnoticed. It went unnoticed and unappreciated. Is it worth it? She often wondered. Is there something better I could be doing with my time? And it was during one of these moments of questioning that she heard this still small voice of her heavenly father speak to her heart. You are a wife and mother because that is what I have called you to be. Much of what you do is hidden from the public eye, but I notice most of what you give is done without remuneration, but I am your reward. You can take this in your daily life in that example of that living sacrifice. When you think things are going unnoticed, your father notices. He sees. His son Jesus Christ sees. Continuing on. Your husband cannot be the man I have called him to be without your support. Your influence upon him is greater than you think and more powerful than you will ever know. I bless him through your service and honor him through your love. Your children are precious to me, even more precious than they are to you. I have entrusted them to your care to raise for me. What you invest in them is an offering to me. You may never be in the public spotlight, but your obedience shines as a bright light before me. Continue on. Remember, you are my servant. Do all to please me. And I say, brethren, to the children of God, we too must carry on. We too must be that light. And we too must glorify our Father and be that living sacrifice that He has called us to be.
shines.